Good. Well, thanks everyone for joining us again after our break. And yeah, we've come through a lot of material and by all means, keep your questions coming. Speaking of questions, I wanted to sort of jump the gun and share with you some of the many questions that have come to me over the last two years since I first really started sharing these techniques with people en masse. And they are, the, what I'm going to share with you is really just a compilation of some of the most common questions that come in and some answers that I think will really help you and put a lot of what we have done in context. And just to look ahead, the next thing that we're going to do are some advanced concepts and then some review of everything. So basically, in looking at these questions, what I want you to do is think about what we've gone through and think about how that you can apply some of these questions to the process before you ever get started, uh, which I'm sure that you're going to do immediately after today's presentation, if you haven't already. So the first sort of question that comes up a lot, and it's a very interesting one and a true one, is that memory palaces are not always shaped in convenient ways. In fact, I would say that they're never shaped in convenient ways. I mean, nobody builds a building thinking that later this is going to be a great memory palace and we're going to be able to you know, store this, store particular information in this memory palace. It just doesn't happen that I know of, although there's certain art projects about memory palaces that have incorporated that kind of idea. So what do we do with the idea that memory palaces not only are not perfectly shaped for the uses that we're putting them to, but that we end up wasting certain stations. There are areas that either cannot be used or because of the amount of information that we're memorizing, for instance, a small amount of information in, a, say, 10 pieces of information in a memory palace with 20 stations, aren't we wasting those stations because we don't have enough information to store there? Well, the first thing I would say to this is that we're not ever wasting stations. First of all, there is always the use of memory palace building as an important part of becoming better at memorizing, as an important part of preparing ourselves for times when we want to have memory palaces to use. And there's just no waste in that. It's a great mental exercise. It's a great way of increasing your visual imagination, your spatial imagination. So any efforts that you put into building memory palaces will never go to waste, regardless of whether you are unable at in a, pre, in a current project to use some of the stations that you have placed in there. So there's not really this concern. But let's say that you do have a 20, palace or a 20 station memory palace and you have 10 pieces of information and you do feel that those things are going to waste. Well, one thing you can do is have two subjects in the same palace and just simply know that the second sequence starts at station 11 rather than station 10. You're just moving to a different thing. This is very useful in foreign language vocabulary where if you're using the techniques that I talk about for that specific purpose, you will come to different kinds of vocabulary if you're shaping it with using word division and the bridging figures. You're going to come to AB words that turn to AC words and that's not going to completely map up in a memory palace and you can switch in stride. You can go from AB to AC. And if you're doing your recall rehearsal, this is never going to be a problem. And the same thing goes with any subject. You can switch. And by not ever being a problem, what I mean to say is that when you're going to recall the information, you just sort of flash to that place, if you flash there at all. By going through these exercises, you really th think of this as training wheels on a bicycle. You are riding th with this training wheel system for as long as it takes to ride without, without it, and that's sort of the goal. So how you organize your memory palaces, it doesn't need to waste any stations. And as I was mentioning before, if you feel like you've run out of places in a station, you can strategically leave the door of one place and enter another by just doing some magical 
reordering of reality in your mind. So the example of that was leaving your house and instead of stepping out into the driveway, you're stepping into a building in your school. And that's a very reasonable thing to do. The only catch to that is, is you need to remember what comes next. And if you're using alphabetization uh, to organize your memory palaces, then that's a major clue. So to state it out very clearly, if I had my Aristotle memory palace being Allen's house and my Bataille memory palace being Brocklehurst High School where I went to school, those, th those two places are in two different cities. Yet, if I wanted to directly move from the end of Allen's house to the entrance of Brocklehurst High School, they don't need to be in the same city in order for that travel to occur. So again, there's really no waste stations. And to the person who sent this question, this might be something that I mentioned before, the idea of a scarcity mindset when you're kind of worried about holding on to everything and not having any value or anything leaking out, anything going unused. That uh, is not necessarily the way to think about it. So again, you're always getting exercise from it. And also, I should mention too that you're expanding your imagination about what's possible, what exists in the world. And you're seeing world, the world in a spatial way. So for example, I was at the Polygot conference last weekend and someone was asking me to demonstrate how I would turn that place into a memory palace. And I just went boom, 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 and made a linear journey. And it was really great. And I can see that place in my mind very, very sharply because I went through that. If I hadn't, I still have a great memory of the place. I still would be able to use it as a memory palace. But by walking into a place and seeing that, 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 these are stations, th it just becomes a much more powerful resource. So I would say there's no wasting. It's always an exercise. It's always part of expanding things that you can use later. And you can just get started just thinking about every building that you go into from now on, the potential use as a memory palace, and just start thinking that would be a station, that would be a station. So that's a sort of a long answer, but there is no wastage at all. And the world is filled with memory palaces or buildings that you can use as memory palaces. And with practice, you can use outside locations very, very wonderfully as well. Uh, and there's just nothing to fear uh, of ever running out. So the next question that I get quite a bit and I've sort of covered already is no matter what I try, I cannot become more visual. Is visual imagination strictly necessary? Well, I talked one time with Dr. Jim Samuels who wrote a book called Remind Yourself. There's an interview on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast with him. And he said that Really, everybody's visual. There's no one who's not visual. Uh, even, well, if you can see, you're visual. That's really the basics of it. And we went through a number of exercises that demonstrated how to bridge yourself into a more visual, visual imagination if uh, you don't already have one. But this raises the question of, is it necessary? And I don't think so. You can just simply think about actions. You can think about what things look like, and you can deploy them at a conceptual level and have them interacting. And this is actually something that, if you are a very good visual person, you could exploit this idea by reversing the process. You could practice trying to memorize things without using visuals and just thinking about the concepts. And I don't know exactly how that would work, but it's nonetheless, the idea that one isn't visual or can't use their imagination is really a, a non-issue in my thinking. What matters is getting started. And this, the first visual way to get started is to build a memory palace. And that's as simple as looking at a building in your mind's eye or actually going and visiting it. Because if you're not visual... If you don't feel that you're visual in your imagination, then you can simply go to a place and look at it. And if you have eyes, and if your eyes work, then you are seeing something, and that is a visual situation. That said, there are some interesting people who have written to me. One in particular is a woman who said that she really liked when she had access to a memory palace or a building that she used as a memory palace. She liked to go into that place and to close her eyes and run her hands along the wall and go through the rooms with her eyes closed, running her hands along the walls. And 
I thought that was absolutely brilliant because it's accessing another representation center in your brain. So typically we say that your brain has visual, auditory, um, touch, kinesthetic, and then we have olfactory and gustatory, and then we have cognition or, or conceptual senses. And so she's almost bringing a number of those together because you can hear with your eyes closed, you can touch the wall with your eyes closed, and you can conceive with your conceptual mind where you're going, and perhaps your smell would come up as well. Like if you had a plant, then you would know you were approaching the plant and so forth. And so multiple senses are being activated at the same time, and the brain is using them to fill the blank space that the eyes aren't seeing. So this is a very, very interesting exercise to not rely on visual stuff as much because you're accessing all the other senses. So that's a quite unique way to think of things. And I've tried it myself. The other thing is is to incorporate more more kinesthetic movement. And one of the things that you'll see with a bonus that's coming with this training is my interview with Robert Adut. And he, when he's describing how he memorized mathematical formulas, complex things, I call them like spaghetti noodles because the, to me they're so abstract and strange, but he kept making kinesthetic gestures and really putting a lot of energy into it and this is just something that you can do as well and you could also if you're using a memory palace that you currently have access to you can go and step in that station or near that station or beside it and act something out if you wanted to in order to get your body involved and i've even tried this myself by using the room that you've seen in the picture where i'm sitting at my desk to memorize german lyrics from you know, a song that Marlena Dietrich sang, and I actually stepped, stood in the places where I was storing the associative imagery to help me recall the lyrics, which is a double challenge because I'm memorizing lyrics and memorizing them in German. And by moving, by actually standing in those places and moving, I'm accessing other representational sensors in my brain, and this is just very, very powerful. Of course, you can't do it with all memory palaces if you're using childhood homes and so forth where you no longer have access to them. But nonetheless, if you do, this is a way to get started. So not having a visual imagination is most unlikely or most it's most unlikely that you don't have a visual imagination. And even if you do, some of these things I've just talked about are really powerful suggestions to hack that system, so to speak. And here's a very interesting question that's close to my own heart and soul, which is, I'm on medication for a condition and it interferes with my concentration and my ability to think and conceive of ideas. What should I do? And really this is part of my big journey myself into memory techniques, having to take antidepressive medication or depression, actually things that depress me for being manic at times. And they really messed with my concentration a great deal. And it was really in the midst of this deep and dark depression that I started to find memory techniques that helped me. I was evading actually studying <laughs> because it was so terrible how I couldn't concentrate. So I started playing around with magic tricks because I was having fun and learning magic tricks. And that's how I sort of came across the idea that you could memorize a deck of cards. And, you know, that's one very big point is when you are unable to concentrate on things, it may just be that the things you're concentrating on are not that interesting to you. So you either change your life so that you are changing, uh, concentrating on things that are interesting to you, or you find a way to make them more interesting. And that's what memory palace work really does, is if you're memorizing dry, boring information, you can make it much more exciting by using these wild pictures, using familiar locations to give it personal meaning and integrate with it and make it so much more interesting to you. So there's really no such thing as dry information. But when it comes specifically to pills, I'm, I am a doctor in the sense of having a PhD. I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't give any particular advice in that area. And certainly one should take the medication that is recommended to them or experiment with it at, under doctor, a doctor's supervision. But I will say that things that have helped me and that also blend into having a greater visual imagination have to do with meditation, getting enough rest, having better diet, 
having movement and exercise and fitness as a key component of life. Also interacting with other people, making sure you're not isolated, and writing all the time, every day, at some level, drawing, just keeping the mind active. And that can be difficult. I know what it's like to be depressed and to just be completely ruined by depression, but at some level I was able to really find a way through it. I found it through magic tricks, which I've become a little bit profession, proficient with over the years, but you may have something else, playing piano, drawing, painting, whatever it may be. So you can build your way into greater concentration. And there's other, one other thing that I always found really interesting and when I learned it and started to do and try to do as often as possible is that we are set in routines and we follow those routines again and again. And they're really life-killing in a way. And what I mean by routines is one always walks down the street from one on the sidewalk, basically in a linear pattern and so forth. But there's signposts and things. And just imagine you're walking down the street, and instead of doing the normal thing, which is to walk down the sidewalk, you see a post, and then you walk around it in a circle. And you see a mailbox, and then you walk around that in an opposite circle. And you just do something to change the normal pattern, to disrupt what you're normally going through. And no matter how depressed you are, just that sort of activity can break things through and lead to a new sort of thing. So if you're struggling with concentration or the ability to conceive of things, change something. And it's as simple as just walking backwards and doing a little skip hop or something like that, or the other exercises that I've suggested. And then build that into using visuals in the exercises that have been given throughout this training. And just the, the sort of things that I've been talking about are just incre incredibly powerful if you give them a try. Another question that comes in a lot is, how do I develop the necessary self-discipline to use the stuff that I'm teaching in the magnetic memory method into daily life? And I'm aware that the amount of time that it takes to describe this material, these techniques and strategies, makes it seem like a lot of work. But once you've discovered uh, the material and started to apply it, you begin to see that the stuff I'm talking about takes minutes, really. It takes sometimes less than minutes. And so... Integrating it into your everyday life is as simple as deciding, first of all, that you're going to do it. It's actually taking that first step. And as I talked about before, being aware of this idea that 90% of people who try something and don't get an immediate result will just quit and never try it again. They'll blame the thing rather than taking responsibility for it. And they'll not ever try again. So if you try one more time, you're already in the 10% of people who are essentially doing more. And the more you do, the more you will get out of it. And so it's just a matter of finding a place to start. And no one can really tell you exactly the right place to start. It's up to you to find your way in, find a point of access, give yourself the opportunity to do it through deciding that you'll do it, and just pick one thing. John Cage, the composer, said, begin anywhere. And that's really appropriate, and it's appropriate in the Memory Palace technique as well. I've given multiple points of entry. I recommend that you start with building Memory Palaces, but you could start by going to Wikipedia and putting in famous celebrities or famous actors or famous politicians and just begin looking at people and thinking about how you might use them to memorize stuff in the techniques that I've been talking about. Or you could take a step by not building Memory Palaces, but you could go out and just start looking at buildings a different way before that you even start drawing them out or you, making a top-down list. Just go out with the intention that the next time you go to the grocery store, you're going to think about it as a memory palace. So you want to use things that you're doing anyway and use them as a platform or a springboard into adding something else. You have to go to the grocery store at least sometimes. You have to even go just to the washroom sometimes or you won't be alive. So you want to think about, well, how could I add just this one thing in order to do that? And that's also how you begin to develop self-discipline. You just add one thing and integrate one thing and just simply not accept from yourself that you're not going, that, you know, it's too hard or anything like that. You want to just add things. And, you know, when you're talking on the phone with someone, you can start talking about what you're doing and actually teach other people 
the sorts of things that you've learned. Even if you're not a master yet, teaching, learning is always sort of relearning, and we relearn through, through description. So when you're talking to other people, just take a moment to describe what you're doing and actually give the lesson about what you've learned so far, and that becomes part of the discipline because it's not just acting, but it's also describing. It's not just doing, it's also explaining. And you move, you become a master through these sorts of activities. When I studied sitar, the major myth, uh, well, not the major myth, it's actually a, a sort of practical reality, but I don't think it needs to take this long, was the idea that it was 20 years to be a student of sitar, 20 years to perform sitar, and 20 years to teach sitar before you could become a guru at sitar music. But you know, you can do all three of those things at once in order to really accelerate your mastery. So self-discipline comes from getting started and keeping going, and part of that is teaching others. And that's why at the end of my daily newsletter, I always end with teach somebody else what you've learned about memory palaces. Not because, you know, I want everybody to be talking about the magnetic memory method, which is great, but I want to actually have this go even more viral than it's already become because of all the other wonderful things that are going on in the current mnemonics renaissance. So it's really just about not only spreading the word, but by describing something, you're teaching yourself how to use it better, how to think about it better, and you're deepening and compounding that. Another question is, I do not have enough memory palaces, and I haven't seen many places in my life, and I'm not going anywhere more to see other places. What do I do? We're going to have a whole hour on that but in brief are you really sure that you can't visit more places would be my first answer to that there there's even i lived in the forest and i found places to use as memory palaces i lived 20 minutes from a city and i still went and explored there was an old graveyard there was a a farm for peacocks there was a turkey farm there was a road that went up to uh, another sort of farm and there was some sort of fish hatchery. I mean, there's all kinds of places that you can begin to shape out. Now, these were outdoor locations, and it's a little bit more advanced. And I, again, I don't reckon, re recommend that beginners use it, even though, like I said, Phil Chambers thinks there's really no difference. But one thing that you can do is you can impose difference on places. So if you found a little dell or you found a field, you could actually imagine what it would be like if there were walls around it and see that in a contained space, contain it with an imaginary cube or something like that. This, again, the point is, is to get started, to not let any sort of scarcity thinking get in the way of actually doing something. And on that note, I would really recommend that as soon as possible, as soon as you are beginning to use, build memory palaces and so forth, is to actually start filling them with information as soon as possible. Because building memory palaces is a great activity, but it's not necessarily the fullest accomplishment. And a lot of people confuse activity with accomplishment. And the end goal is to be able to memorize things and recall them effectively. So you want to get from the activity stage to the accomplishment stage as soon as possible. And so when people say, well, I don't have any memory palaces around me, I don't have enough, I live in the forest, or I live isolated from the city and so forth, just start with your house and then begin to think about how you can add stuff. And the next time, surely you're going to go somewhere to the hardware store or anything like this, then begin to think about that and just add memory palaces as you go along. And again, there's a whole section coming strictly devoted to virtual memory palaces and other sorts of variations so that if you're really stuck in a prison somewhere, let's say, and you're, n you're in isolation because you're, you know, been taken to the basement and you only have a little window that bread comes through every, every three times a day or something like this, then there are options for you, and, and we'll talk about those. Another question is, what about creating multiple tracks in a memory palace? For instance, the bottom of a wall as opposed to the middle of the wall and then where the wall connects with the ceiling. And this is actually really something that is a way of multiplying stations in a memory palace room. So if you can imagine a sort of spiral effect, if you were to normally enter a room or use a room and you started on the wall, on the floor, and then you just moved sticking with the floor, well, then you may get four stations. But if you were to start on the upper corner and use the upper corner, the, upper m the middle of the upper wall, then the next corner, and you went around, 
and then you spiraled down and then went around and then spiraled down and used the floor space. Well, you've multiplied that room incredibly. And that is a powerful technique, but I'd say it's, it's advanced for more people. But you're creating multiple tracks. Another thing that you can do along a journey is not just have a, a spiral through a room using the walls in that way, but you can also... Uh, it's a bit more advanced and it's good for foreign language vocabulary if you're using if you're memorizing more than one language at the time at a time or working with more than one language at a time is to just sort of if you can if it's appropriate to the memory palace have three tracks so that your one track is containing a certain amount of information the other track another amount of information and the third track but again this is really sort of more advanced level stuff definitely worth experimenting with because experimentation is a part of developing and giving things a try. And the worst thing that can happen is that you learn that you like something else better and that something else really works for you. So you go back to that older technique that's working for you from an informed basis rather than never having tried something out. So I heard from someone named Pat Flynn on his podcast that he said his life would he'd rather have his life filled with oh well than I wish I would have so experiment with this stuff so that you never have to say at the end of your life oh I wish I would have experimented more with memory palaces just get in there so that if something doesn't work the the worst thing that can happen is you say oh well that didn't work right and then don't be part of the 90% that never revisits it again be part of the 10% that tries it again because the next time you may have more purchase and so that's a really great idea with the spiraling around and definitely worth exploiting and experimenting with. Now, here's a good question. How do I make images large in my mind if they're crammed into a small space, like a bookshelf? And you can use bookshelves I inside of rooms, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But yeah, that is a kind of paradox when you're placing a piece of information on a chair or in a bookshelf or on a bed, how do you see Godzilla smashing through uh, Barbie's dollhouse on a bookshelf, right? This is a massive sized thing. And really the answer is, is just that because it's in a small space doesn't mean you can't imagine it being very large and filled with action and so forth. In fact, if anything, that small space should make that action even stranger and weirder and more vibrant and m more filled with action because you're putting it in that space. So I wouldn't think about cramming it into that space or compressing it into that space. I would think of it more as actually it just taking place in that place so that you're still capitalizing on the energy. And if you want to see it in miniature, then that's fine. One of, the, one of the things that is kind of individual to people is are you seeing it on the living room, uh, the coffee table? Are you seeing it beside the coffee table? Are you seeing it where the coffee table is in place of the coffee table? This is all going to be directly linked to how you are as a memorizer and what sorts of things you prefer and the situation itself. Um, when I use a bed, it's typically on the bed, but some people like to use under the bed or they like to use both under the bed and on top of the bed. In either case, this idea that things are being crammed there is perhaps not such a good way to think about it. You want them placed there. You want them invited to be there, and you want them to be magnetized there so that they want to be there and the information wants to be there. So in other words, if you have problems with this and it's not working for you, it's not producing a result because you're not, it's not free enough or it's not enough big space for you, then don't use it. Try to find a situate that information somewhere that it will work. But again, practice and try and see if you can find a way around that. And generally approach things from a spirit of it not being an issue, just being something to experiment with and to try and expand and, and grow with your abilities. The next question is, can a memory palace be used to erase bad memories? And this question has come to me in several different forms over the last while and the idea here is is that if you can use a memory palace to create and store memories can you actually get rid of memories using the same thing and this is actually something that is possible there is a, a possibility to take a sad feeling or a negative feeling 
and actually bring it into a memory palace, a powerful space in your mind, and then change its color, change its size, change its speed. There's something called neuro-linguistic programming, which is a big self-help movement sort of thing that emerged in the 70s, of course, emerging from other previous things in culture that were going on with Erzat psychology and so forth. And they talked a lot about getting an image in your mind about something negative and making it big and s- just stupid and so that a negative thing became ridiculous that you could laugh at or taking the color out of it so it's like an old black and white movie and that reduces the impact on you so it's not nearly as shocking or whatever you're dealing with doesn't affect you nearly as much. And I think that that's pretty good stuff, but putting it in the location that you deal with it is is even more amazing so that you actually have a context. And of course, then you want to be very, very selective of what kind of memory palace that you use to deal with things like that. So you could, in fact, build a a negative destroying memory palace or a nullifying memory palace and actually just use it for the purposes of getting rid of negative feelings. And uh, you can apply this to self-help sorts of issues in your life. One thing that I would mention, I already mentioned Dr. Jim Samuels in his book, Remind Yourself, and the interview we did on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. And he said something really amazing about how that by being able to memorize what people say to you in a conversation, when that conversation goes awry or has some sort of negative things and they're arguing with you and they're giving their position in a particularly hostile manner, what he talked about is being able to memorize that stuff, you can calm yourself down in that process. And not only that, but remember exactly what they said. So you can address each point from a position of calmness, non-negativity, and absolute clarity and detail, which really takes the steam out of situations of conflict. So that relates to this question as well. So I highly recommend reading Jim Samuel's book, Remind Yourself. And yeah, so there's a lot of potential there. And I think actually I would add that that's especially uh, powerful for students because when you're at a particular age, you are, of course, dealing with a lot of emotions when you're a student age, typical student age, and you things can be more dramatic to you than they will be later in your life. So this hack could be incredibly powerful for just making things non-issues. Now, another question we've addressed already a few times in the presentation is, will I always have to revisit memory palaces in order to recall the information? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, It depends on what stage you are at in putting the information into long-term memory. And again, what does long-term memory mean? Does that mean that it's never going to fade and never go away? Well, not really. Uh, Things integrate and things become part of your general palette. But in terms of the short-term goals for an exam or a test and so forth, those may be times when you want to really be able to rely on the training wheels or the crutch of the memory palace so that you know that that stuff is rehearsed and it's there and you know exactly where you need to go in your mind and to find it and you have it totally stabilized and balanced on a platform. But with proper recall rehearsal in the ways that I've been talking about, you'll be able to get stuff into long-term memory that really involves no going back to the memory palace, but you'll flash onto it, and you'll have a sense of it having been there, and it almost becomes a, a nice feeling. It's a pleasant thing to do to have that association come to mind. So you don't have to, but I think by default, you almost certainly will revisit it I- at some level in your mind. So that's another question. Now, do I need memory exercises and drills? The No, not necessarily. And this question w- came up again when I was at the Polyglot Conference last weekend where someone was saying, I know the techniques, I know the method, I've used them, I know it works, don't need to convince me, I don't need to go out and do this sort of stuff, I just need to use it and it, I'm happy with that, so why bother with memorizing abstract numbers and so forth? Well, the reason that you might want to bother with memory exercises and drills is to get better at it. You know, I think that everybody can do a couple of push-ups, but can you do 50? And do you have the benefits of having done 50, which enable you to do 60 much easier than if you can only do 10? And do you get the other benefits of having a better heart rate, better breathing abilities, better posture, 
you know, you don't get those things if you just know what a push-up is. You know, everybody knows what a push-up is. Now, this is a little bit different in terms of using your mind, but the the fact remains the same. You'll never know the full power of what this stuff can do for you and what it can help you achieve if you're not memorizing at a higher level and pushing yourself and challenging yourself and just becoming better through drills. And I often talk about how it's just not that useful to memorize stuff that you're never going to use. But as I've been experimenting and thinking about it, there, there is this beneficial effect of actually working with abstract material like pi and so forth if you want to push yourself and get better. Because the more you can c make concrete stuff out of abstractions, the greater skills you build in terms, uh, in terms of making concrete things abstract. So it has benefits that way as well. But you, you will have major effects just by learning these methods and using them without having drills and exercises. But I definitely recommend that if you want to get at to higher levels, then certain exercises are great. And one thing that I do every day, even though I know it by, by rote now, so to speak, is I always spend some time going through the alphabet backwards. And it's just an amazing sort of thing that I love to do, and it feels good. And also not just going through the alphabet backwards, but also going A, Z, B, Y, and this sort of thing, and forward and backwards, so that you're challenging your brain to jump through the different parts of the alphabet. And it's a great exercise that uses your memory, uses your spatial location abilities in terms of the actual layout of an alphabet and skipping back and forth. And so it's a great thing, and it actually makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you've done push-ups with your mind, and if you're ever in a bad mood and you run some, it doesn't have to be the alphabet backwards. It could be a poem or something like this, and you just get so many benefits from it besides exercise, just a great uplifting feeling. Another question is, how can I avoid not crossing my own path when I'm going in and out of rooms in my memory palace? And I covered this uh, already when we were talking about looking at the diagram of the house, moving from place to place, and not crossing our own path, not trapping ourselves and so forth. And this is really the peer versus enter technique. And so instead of going into the room and walking around it and bumping into furniture and so forth, just stand at the door and look around at the different stations. And this is, I mean, standing in at the door in your imagination. And you may find that you you don't even need to do that. You can just sort of go to the places in your mind because you've done the work of setting up a linear journey. You don't actually have to see yourself moving from place to place. You can just kind of go to those places without there being any sort of not crossing your own path because you're not there to physically cross your own path. Um, but if you are, some people do tell me that they really like to see themselves moving through the palace or if they're using a bridging figure Al Pacino or Robert De Niro or someone like this, they like to actually follow this figure from place to place and see them moving. So really you could just have them looking into a room so they're not crossing their own path. I don't really mean for people to make this big deal out of not crossing their own path. It has to do with speed and efficiency and the economy of means, that ability to move from place to place without thinking about what comes next. And so it's just a general principle and a guideline, and I think one that serves you incredibly well when you use it. And I'm often thanked for drawing that point out and describing it and sort of repeating it again and again as a key technique because it helps people a lot. But if you're having any trouble with that, just simply peer into rooms rather than entering them. And if a room is somehow not, you can't incorporate it into your memory palace, then by all means, just skip that room. You're going to gain so much more by having clarity and directness in your memory palace than you are by hanging on to every single room, every single station that has potential to be used when you could just be getting going and creating a much more elegant journey by not having the scarcity mindset of using everything that's at your at your availability and focusing just on what can be used in the most strategic way. This one is a really important thing, is the question of overwhelm. And a lot of people th think this is incredibly detailed and what do I do to simplify the process? Sort of already gone over this as well already, but simplification really has to do with practice, with actually doing. And you'll find that if you're learning an instrument and so forth, especially stringed instruments, you, you sometimes 
are playing on the wrong string, something that you could be playing on another string and have a greater ease of economy. But you only learn that by learning the fretboard, learning and trying different things and seeing how they all work. And you simplify a song that you've learned by trying those out and seeing where the hand positions can work better in terms of the economy of the whole song. Overwhelm is also a choice. If you're doing something and it's overwhelming you, really just stop, step back, relax, analyze the situation, get a bit clinical about it, not personally involved. Remember the Bruce Lee quote, no self, no enemy, and just see if you can remove your ego from it because that's a huge, a, lot, a big part of the problem of overwhelm. And certainly in my life, whenever I get frustrated by something, it's usually because the ego has jumped up and says this isn't possible. And we can go into all kinds of psychophroidian babble about why the ego needs to do that. And really, it just we're always in survival mode at some level, and we're just we're just driven to fulfill the needs of the moment and frustration fulfills the need of the moment by misdirecting us from our actual long-term goals and giving us some kind of drama but if you can get past that you or step back from it as the case may be you never need to be overwhelmed really by anything except for emergencies and then of course if you've ever studied the psychology of emergency the brain typically has something called shock which prevents you from being overwhelmed and takes you into this sort of passive state so really there's no need to be overwhelmed and if you are in an emergency that's overwhelming then your your biology will take care of that for you so no self no enemy how do i find time for the magnetic memory method well just decide to have time it's like anything else you can create time in your life when i was writing my dissertation i had a saying over my desk that said none of us work nearly as hard as we think we do and this was a very, very powerful concept for me to have before my eyes all the time. And I don't have it before my eyes anymore because I've memorized it. But I'm never nearly as busy as I think I am. People ask me all the time, how do you write a newsletter every single day? Produce books, novels are coming out. You obviously manage all this stuff because there's video books and video cor or sorry, audio books and video courses. Like, how is this possible? And it's possible because I make the time. I set up a strategy, set up systems. It's the one place where I would use systems rather than methods in order to, um, to just get things done, be strategic about it, and make it happen. Identify that it's my passion, it's something that I want to do, and make the time in accordance to the outcome that I want to see. Um, and this is a very, very important thing that you can do. So if you want to do this stuff, you can find the time to do it by being strategic about that as well. And make sure that it is something that you want to do and that you're passionate about it, or at the very least that you're passionate about accomplishing what it is that you can accomplish through having a better memory and having better strategies memorized. Um, is it time for questions? He's asking the question that occasionally he's taking photographs of places that he thinks would make useful memory places. Is this also a practice that you have tried yourself, Anthony? Yeah, I have, actually. I Thank you for that question. I, I have used that strategy, and actually there's an app that has come out recently called Mind Palace, and it's for iPhone. Maybe there's an Android version, I'm not sure. But it actually gives you photographs of famous places. And my ideal, actually, is something that I'm working on. I've been talking with uh, an app developer is to actually have an app that allows you to take your own photographs and integrate them into an app and then be able to take the actually label the stations so that you can see that. This is not something that's ever for me. I don't need this. I'm really able to manage this in my mind, but it's something I want to develop for other people so that they can build and see memory palaces in real time before their eyes using an app. But in the meantime, until that I'm able to do that, uh, there is something called Mind Palace, and I'm, I've been in contact with the, the creator of that, and he's going to be a guest eventually on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, and we'll be able to talk about that more. But definitely in the meantime, by all means, take photographs so that you can study later, and take photographs specifically about what the stations can be, and take the photographs in the order that the stations would appear in the Memory Palace to the best of your ability so that later when you're building them, you have that sort of linear journey documented.
Right. I have a follow-up question. Do um, you think that the worlds of video games, right, those complex 3D games and the worlds and the, the 3D environments are also um, capable or appropriate f um, as, as memory palaces, to serve as memory palaces? Yeah, we're going to talk about that actually in the uh, in the, n the next level. Okay. Got it. Okay. So then we, we go into that actually in, in pretty pretty big detail. 